Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So we haven't had an art episode in a minute, so I was having a Jones about it. <laughs> yeah. When I first read this outline and it said that, I was like, haven't we? And then I went, oh, no, we really haven't. Mm-mm. I always feel guilty because I'll sometimes do a couple clump together and then I'm like, I shouldn't only talk about artists. Um, And then I will shy away from them for a little while. But it's been a minute, so I feel okay about it. So today we are going to talk about Anthony Van Dyke. Uh, And right out of the gate, I feel like we have to talk about his name because you'll see it written a million different ways. There is a a reason for that. Um, Like, and also pronounced, right, um slightly differently. I feel like I looked at a million videos of like art curators and art historians and they all kind of default to the anglicized Anthony Van Dyke. Uh, But you'll see like Van Dyke written with a J in it or with a W in it (laughs) Um, in a very Italian style where it's Antonio written Italian style spelling and then Van Dyke is one word run together with no differential of capital letters to separate Van and Dyke. It's like one big thing. Even Van Dyke with a B, um, etc. There are a lot of different ways. And the reason is he moved around a lot and he didn't seem especially hung up on there's one correct way to do my name. <laughs> Even <laughs> when he got accolades in various countries, he would be like, no, just do it this way. Um, which I find really, really interesting about him. I also feel like we should mention, we'll talk about the names of his paintings in this, but these are names that for the most part were attributed well after he made them. And sometimes they're just a way that various art historians have identified the painting usually by the contents of the painting. He wasn't out there, to the best of our knowledge, giving them any kind of naming convention that we're not privy to. Um, I really, really like his work, and so he's been on my list for a long time. I think he's a genius, and I love him. And I also just think he's an interesting guy because he seems kind of relaxed in some ways. <laughs> and he's tied to a lot of interesting things in art history. So that's what you get today. We'll start, of course, at the beginning. Anthony Van Dyke was born on March 22nd, 1599 in Antwerp. At the time, Antwerp was part of the Spanish Netherlands. His father, Franz, was a successful silk merchant, and his mother, Maria Kuypers, was Franz's second wife. There were a dozen children in this family. Anthony was the seventh of them. The family lived on Groot Market, which is Antwerp's central square, until they moved to a bigger house in 1607. But just a few weeks after they made that move to their bigger house, his mother Maria died. And from that moment, that privileged, comfortable life that the Van Dykes had enjoyed kind of began to unravel. Franz, his father, did not remarry, though he did have other relationships, and it seems as though without a mother to care for them full-time, the kids were left largely to their own devices. Simultaneously, Franz started to really struggle with the business side of his life as well as his personal life. When Anthony was 10, he started to formally study painting under Hendrik von Balen at the Antwerp Artist Guild. He didn't stay with Van Balen for very long, though, and it's not clear when their teaching arrangement ended. The oldest surviving Van Dyck painting was made when the artist was only 14 in 1613. This is sometimes called Portrait of a Man or the slightly more descriptive Portrait of an Old Man, sometimes Portrait of an Unknown 70-Year-Old Man. This is a bust-up rendering of a man in a stiff, Elizabethan-style rough collar. He has a robust white mustache and a pointed goatee. Today, this is part of the Royal Museum of Fine Arts of Belgium's collection, and it serves as an early example of the way Van Dyck's career trajectory always seemed to be destined for portraits, although that was not the only style of painting he was interested in. At the age of 15 or possibly 16, Anthony painted a self-portrait. This is, once again, a bust and head image with the artist seen from the side, and his head is turned to face the viewer. 
It is overall a dark composition. He has reddish curly hair. His face is very pale and tinged with pink. And his reddish lips form a very sharp contrast to the background in his clothes. There's also a line of white that peeks out above his collar. It's his undershirt. But that line of white creates this sort of diagonal bisecting of the overall piece. At this point, Van Dyke appears to have left the tutelage of Van Balen and was working as an independent artist. But that's odd. Per the guild rules of Antwerp, he should not have been able to establish himself as a professional artist before being granted membership in that guild. He was too young to do that at this point. He didn't become a member of the guild until 1618. That is also the year that Van Dyck began to study under Peter Paul Rubens. And at this time, Rubens was 41, and he had gained a reputation as one of Antwerp's best artists. This association would link the two men forever historically. In 1672, Giovanni Pietro Bellori published the work Le Vite di Pittori, Scultori, et Architetti Moderni. Those are the lives of the modern painters, sculptors, and architects. And in this work, he described the two men meeting in a rather romanticized way, saying that Van Dyck just sort of showed up at Peter Paul Rubens' school as a, quote, young man possessed of such noble generosity of manners and so fine a talent for painting, that then it goes on to say that, of course, Rubens recognized that having this young man as a student was going to bring honor to his school. <laughs> but that's really a speculative take on this meeting. We don't know much at all in the way of specifics about the earliest associations of these two men. Art historian Christopher White's 2021 biography of Van Dyke speculates that although Rubens and Van Dyke were very different personalities, Rubens may have recognized some similarities in their backgrounds and their turbulent family lives, and that may have been part of him deciding to become a mentor. We truly don't know, though. But Van Dyck, we do know, became not only a student of Rubens, but also an assistant, giving up his independent career status to do so. And at some point, he started living with Rubens, although the exact date that happened is unknown. He's mentioned as being there and working on pieces with the master in letters and notes of various people in 1620. We're going to talk more about the nature of their friendship and relationship in a bit, but this living situation, to be clear, was not indicative of anything in particular, other than that Van Dyck was working closely with the senior artist. It would not have been uncommon for an assistant to do so and move in. In the early years of his professional career, Van Dyck painted a lot of portraits of Belgian aristocracy. Most of these portraits are from the bust up, although some go down to the knees. The poses all tend to be pretty similar, with the subject holding some kind of accessory. It quickly became apparent that he was incredibly skilled in painting fabrics. Sometime in 1618 or 1619, he painted a portrait of a man drawing on his glove and a married couple, both of them echo paintings by 16th century Flemish artists. Yeah, there have been some really interesting studies that modern historians have done where they have found very similarly posed paintings of other people that previous artists had done. So Van Dyck was clearly, like, using his knowledge and his study of art to inform the way he was working. He was not only working in portraiture, though. He also painted historical subjects. He also created works that blended historical figures or themes with imagery of contemporary models. That's a practice that was very popular at the time. And within these works, his depictions of the people in the paintings are always just incredibly detailed, like mini portraits within the greater work. So when we're talking about this, we're saying, like, he would paint, you know, some important historical or biblical scene, and people that were contemporaries of him would be cast in roles in those, those pieces. An interesting note is that he usually sketched out his religious and historical paintings before actually putting brush to canvas, but he did not usually do the same for portraits. One of the interesting and also frustrating aspects of all this early work is that while we know that most of his works were commissions from the nobility of Antwerp, we don't know who a lot of the people in the paintings are. There's not a lot of notation or surviving record-keeping regarding these works. In some cases, art historians have made sort of best guesses by piecing together information that survived, but these it's just that. It's educated guesses. 
One that we do know is a portrait of Cornelius Vandergeest that serves as a perfect example of how very skilled Van Dyke was even at an early age. The portrait, which is almost a close-up of the subject's face, was created in 1619 or 1620. And the eyes, in particular, are rendered with such skill that they look almost like a photograph. Around the same time that he painted it in the summer of 1620, there's mention of Van Dyck in a letter from Amsterdam to the Duke of Arundel in London, praising him as being almost as admired as Rubens, but lamenting that he seems reluctant to leave Antwerp. Yeah, London was very eager to try to get Van Dyck to come and visit. And I will say that painting that Tracy just described of um, Cornelius van der Geest is one of my very favorites. It is so striking and beautiful. At the age of 18, Van Dyck undertook a work that had nothing to do with his art. He filed a lawsuit against his family. This is tied to his father's personal struggles, and one of those struggles involved a woman that he had been involved with who began to very publicly argue with him and accuse him of wrongdoing. Basically, she was in the street kind of yelling accusations. Uh, In terms of available information, it's unclear what specifically those accusations were. But because of all of this turmoil and, like, the public embarrassment going on, Van Dyke's brothers-in-law filed a motion with the court to be given control of Franz Van Dyke's finances because he was not doing a good job of looking after the family's interests. Anthony filed his own papers asking for the court to name a separate appointee to handle Franz's money as he did not trust his brothers-in-law with it, even though he did recognize that his father really couldn't handle things at that point. The brothers-in-law did get control, and Anthony had to go to court again to get the money that he and his younger siblings were owed by those brothers-in-law. And it would appear that this family situation went from strained to fairly terrible, at least with his relations by marriage. Coming up, we'll talk about Van Dyke's first trip to England, but first we will have a sponsor break. In November 1620, Van Dyke traveled to England for the first time, and it's believed that he was persuaded to do so by one or more art collectors there. As I mentioned earlier, they were eager to get him to England. There, he was commissioned as a painter by King James I, reportedly at a rate of 100 pounds per year. But he didn't stay an entire year. He didn't stay even half a year. He left after four months in February of 1621. He only painted a few works during his time in London, including a historical portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Buckingham as Venus and Adonis. Another, and perhaps more important, was a portrait of the Earl of Arundel. This is very much in the style of Van Dyck's other portraits in the very real-looking face and clothing. The Earl is seated and shown from chair level up. and The natural look of the subject was a significant departure from the portraits that were popular in England at the time. Those tended to look a little more rigid and very formal. They were filled with opulent details, and they featured figures who looked just slightly surreal. These are the traits associated with English mannerism. If you look up English mannerism and then you look at a Van Dyck portrait, you can see where he was like the odd man out of what was going on at the time. This was the very beginning of a shift in portraiture that had begun with Rubens when he painted the work The Countess of Arundel and her retinue, and it really started to crystallize with Van Dyck. England was ready for a change in style, and the Baroque painters of Antwerp offered something fresh and very appealing to the art collectors there. So when he left England far sooner than he was expected to, there was an understanding with the royal court that he would return in roughly eight months to make more paintings. That didn't exactly happen. Upon returning to Belgium, Van Dyck once again painted a number of portraits there, and this time we do know more about the sitters. A seated image of Nicholas Rakox, the mayor of Antwerp, shows the subject seated adjacent to a table on which the busts of Hercules and Zeus are featured, as well as books by Plato and Seneca. Once again, the realistic appearance of the face, the natural expression that had become trademarks of Van Dyck's work are present. So too, in a set of seated portraits of fellow painter Franz Snyders and his wife, Margareta de Vos, In his portraits, Susanna Formont and her daughter, Clara Del Monte, and Isabella Brandt, 
Red and gold tones joined his usual palette of more somber tones to add a level of liveliness that's pretty striking. This is not the first time that he used red and gold. They appeared in the Rakox portrait as well, but it's more prominent in those pieces. In both of these paintings, the subjects all have a look of sort of restrained humor about them. Both of the women and the child depicted look as though they are about to break into a smile. Yeah, they're quite charming. Um, I highly encourage anybody to look at them. He also eventually became really well known for painting children, and he's quite good at that kind of quizzical, always on the verge of a giggle expression. In October 1621, Van Dyck made his way to Italy, arriving first in Genoa. With introductions from Rubens, he had a group of patrons essentially waiting for him there, so he was able to make money right out of the gate. And this was the start of a trip that led to a great deal of artistic growth, partially because of the timing, being out of his period of apprenticeship, and also because he was suddenly exposed to a very vibrant art scene where a lot of different styles were in play at the same time. Plus, there was just a lot of existing art in museums as well as churches to study. This is also a period where Van Dyck made several self-portraits. At least one has been determined to be a repaint over an unfinished commission. All of them, if you just look at his self-portraits, show his growth as an artist and the fine shifts in his technique that led to even greater mastery of showing the subject as a living, emotive entity. He became really well known for just kind of these natural-looking depictions. One thing that jumps out looking at these paintings, though, is what a baby face he still was. He was still in his very early 20s, and while he was clearly a master of his work, he felt like he still had plenty left to learn. Anthony Van Dyke was constantly on the go in Italy, and this period of his life is hard to track in terms of when he was where. Genoa was sort of like a home base that he would return to over and over, but he was routinely making trips to other cities. Throughout his time in Italy, Anthony took advantage of the available art there to continue his studies. He made sketches of a lot of the works of Italian masters, in which he recorded his reactions to and feelings about them. One interesting shift that took place in Van Dyck's Italian travels is that his portraits started to be more frequently full-body portraits instead of busts or knees up. He had painted some full-body portraits before this, but those were outliers. He also started posing his subjects a little bit differently during this time. Often they're facing away from the viewer with their gaze elsewhere, unlike his earlier straight-on perspective. His 1622 portrait of Agostino Pallavicini, the Doge of Genoa, shows this transition starting. The Doge is seated, but his entire body is in the portrait, draped in a dramatic red robe with very wide sleeves, signifying his connection to the Pope, and a white rough collar. This portrait still features the straight-on gaze of the subject's eyes, but his face is turned about one quarter to the viewer's left. The motivations for Van Dyck's choices in travels in Italy remains a bit unclear. Some biographies indicate he was plotting a course of self-study and visiting places like Rome and Venice to take in the art there as part of his education. Others suggest that he had commissions waiting almost everywhere and was just moving around following the financial opportunities that were thick in Italy. Could have even been both. Uh, While in Rome in 1622, Van Dyck painted George Gage with two men, an unusual portrait in its composition of the main subject occupying the left two-thirds of the canvas, seated, but not in what looks like a static pose, His head is turned to the right of the frame, and he looks like he's mid-sentence with the two men who are noted in the title. The two supporting figures are rendered beautifully, of course, but with less detail and in darker hues than Gage is. This painting was made when Gage, who was an English diplomat, was in Rome. Another project in 1622 was a set of portraits of Sir Robert Shirley and his wife, Teresa. These are fascinating portraits because of the clothing involved. Teresa was a Circassian and a noble. The pair had met when Shirley, an adventurer, was in Persia, and after that trip, he took to wearing Persian dress, and he acted as an ambassador for the Shah. And it is in that style that Robert and Teresa were painted, In the husband's portrait, he is standing full length. He is wearing a large turban. 
One hand is resting on his sash, and the other holds a bow with a quiver dangling from a strap that he has in his hand. Lady Shirley is in a really unique, sort of relaxed kneeling pose. Um, She's resting on her folded legs, and her dress is this sumptuous gold and ivory with embellishment and other colors that are kind of these fine little accents to it. And she has a huge veil that billows out around her, and it's topped with an ostrich plume. These portraits were meticulously planned. There are surviving sketches for these, and their composition evolved from the initial plan to the finished pieces. A couple of years into his Italy visit, Van Dyck painted two paintings of the same man, Lucas von Uffel. They're in some ways similar, with von Uffel facing to the right of the frame, even turned a little away from the viewer, and he looks back over his right shoulder. One looks as though he's settled in on his chair, and the other looks as though he's getting up or bracing his hand on the arm of his chair to hold his position. The face is really where the difference is most apparent, though. In the seated image, in which Van Uffel is backed by a large window, he looks placid, almost bored, or maybe questioning. In the second image, which is in a darker interior before a desk, his expression is harder to discern. His eyes are cut sharply to his right to meet the viewer's gaze, And the look on his face could be irritation or judgment, coupled with what feels like the action of rising. The simple differences in the second painting to the first make it feel more dynamic. It's an interesting exercise in comparison. Yeah, they look so similar in many ways, but they're just these very small tweaks that they become completely different. One of the later pieces created during the years that Van Dyck was in Italy offers an example of something he would become well-known for, and I referenced this earlier. That's his portraits of children. In a painting that features three young brothers called the Balbi children, he shows three cherub-faced boys, all of whom obviously look related, but who each showed their own unique personality. These are obviously children from an aristocratic family. Their clothes are pretty formal, they look very luxurious, and each outfit is very different, though they are all in shades of red, gold, gray, and black. We noted that several of his clients in Italy were English, and it's believed that some of them probably made invites to try to get him back to London, but he was not ready to go. Van Dyck returned to Antwerp in the summer of 1627 and for the next five years stayed very busy with portrait commissions there. He eventually was appointed the court painter to Archduchess Isabella. One of his motivations for that return to Antwerp was, once again, family issues. One of his sisters had died, and he once again brought a suit against his brothers-in-law to regain the remainder of the family fortune. To be clear, this was something he did not need. He was financially very successful at this point. He lived a very lavish life. You can find long descriptions of how fancy his clothes were. But remember, he came from a big family, and his siblings were going to lose everything if he didn't intercede. We're about to talk about what's often described as a cooling of the friendship between Van Dyck and Rubens, although it's possible that that friendship has been kind of misinterpreted over the centuries. We'll get to it after we hear from the sponsors that keep the show going. As Anthony reached his 30s, his relationship with Rubens is described as having faltered. And the exact cause for this cooling of their friendship is unknown, but during the period that Van Dyck was in Antwerp following his Italian trip, Rubens was often away. This is because in addition to being an artist, Rubens was also a diplomat, and business dictated his frequent travels. It doesn't appear that Rubens tried to stifle Van Dyck's career or anything. That's often something people theorize. Some of his clients did turn to the younger artist when Rubens was unavailable for commissions, but uh, that doesn't seem to have been an issue. There are plenty of other speculations about why these two men fell out, and it seems like anyone who has studied their work and their relationship has a different idea of what happened. Popular theories include that Rubens became jealous of his student. The possibility that Rubens sabotaged Van Dyck's career by steering him to portraiture is often written about. At the time, portraits were considered a commercial form of art, not like art art. And Rubens did often pass portrait requests on to his students while he focused on 
the more highly regarded religious, historical, and allegorical areas of art. And some of this confusion, once again pointed out by Christopher White, who we referenced earlier, is because historians may have had a very mischaracterized picture of the relationship between Rubens and Van Dyck for all these years. It's always been believed that the two men were very close, but it's entirely possible that theirs was really more of a business relationship. Their lives were just so markedly different. While Van Dyck was focused solely on art his entire life, Rubens, as we just said, was also a diplomat. The older artist also had a wife and children, whereas Van Dyck didn't marry until near the end of his life. So it's possible that based on things like the writings of Bellori that we mentioned earlier, everyone just had this completely wrong take on the situation. And what's been perceived as a rift may have just been a natural drift apart. But it also may have been a matter of insightful recognition of business viability. Antwerp's art patrons may not have been numerous enough to fully support two artists with similar styles, so both men traveled to expand their markets rather than staying together all the time. Starting in the 1630s, Van Dyck produced a series of works that were one color, using chalk or oil to make simple portraits intended for engraving. These were part of the project he undertook with printer and art dealer Martin van den Inden, and the collection, titled Iconography, didn't get published until after Van Dyck's death. In 1632, 11 years after he had left... Anthony Van Dyck finally returned to England, and he was once again greeted warmly by the royal court. King Charles I was in power at that point, and he made the Flemish artist the monarchy's principal painter in ordinary, with a salary of 200 pounds per year. Van Dyck became friendly with the royal family, and he made a lot of portraits of King Charles, Queen Henrietta Maria, and their children. And some of these were used to really humanize the king in the face of growing unrest in the country. So he was kind of a propaganda painter in some ways. During the early part of his time back in London, Van Dyck painted one of his most famous self-portraits, which was Self-Portrait with a Sunflower, This image shows him facing away from the viewer at a three-quarter angle with his head turned back over his right shoulder. In front of him, there's a sunflower, which he appears to be pointing at while fixing his guise squarely on the viewer. His hair is longer and darker than in his earlier portraits, and he has a mustache and a goatee. It's no longer the cherub of his earlier self-portrait work. His outfit, seen from the shoulders up, is of kind of a salmon-y pink color, and he plays with a gold chain that's draped over his shoulder. This is an important work in the private collection of the Duke of Westminster. It is not on public display. Because if it was, I would get a plane ticket today. (laughs) I love this painting. Uh, While he stayed longer than he did on his first trip when he was visiting King James's court, He did return to Antwerp again for a year starting in 1634, once again to handle family business. He was also named Honorary Dean of the Antwerp Guild of Artists during this brief stay in his home country. But he was back in England in 1635, and he moved into the neighborhood of Blackfriars. He spent summers in Eltham Palace. And over the course of several years in London, Van Dyck painted portraits of almost everyone in the nobility and many, many more portraits of King Charles I. Van Dyck's studio in London became a fast-paced whirlwind of creation. Like most masters, he had a group of assistants and apprentices who helped him. When one of his subjects came for a sitting, he would sketch out the rough plan, something he increasingly did for portraits as his career evolved, and then that sketch would be enlarged onto canvas by an assistant. Van Dyck typically painted the face, and then the accompanying elements of the canvas would be completed again by his assistants, with varying degrees of participation from Van Dyck himself. He would apply the finishing touches. Yeah, some of his assistants were doing, like, all of the clothing, but he always did the face. His life at the end of the 1630s and beginning of the 1640s could be described as unsettled, because he was once again often on the move. But he also made the decision to settle down. In early 1640, Anthony married Mary Ruthven, who was lady-in-waiting to Queen Henrietta. This was something of a surprise to a lot of people. Throughout his life, Van Dyck had many relationships with women and often had more than one romance going at a time as he traveled around Europe. He was sort of infamously involved with a woman named Margaret Lemon right up to the time he was married to Ruthven. 
Stories of Margaret are all about how intense and jealous she was and some of the very graphic threats of bodily harm that she issued should Anthony ever cheat on her. She sort of vanishes into the historical record once the painter left her for his marriage to Mary, though. This was, by all accounts, a happy marriage, and soon Mary was pregnant. But though this should have been a time of joy, a shadow was cast when Van Dyke's mentor Rubens died of heart failure in late May of 1640. A few months later, Van Dyke decided to return once more to Antwerp to pay his respects, although this was a brief visit. His final self-portrait was created sometime during this transitional period of his life. It's less colorful than the others, certainly far less so than the sunflower self-portrait, although he's posed at the same angle. This time, he wears a black doublet with white slashing. The background is a simple warm brown, and his curly hair and facial hair are once again included. He looks quite handsome, and his facial expression is mostly neutral, although his eyes once again seem to peer out at the viewer almost as if asking a question. This was all happening at the same time that word spread that King Louis XIII of France needed a decorator for the galleries of the Louvre. Van Dyck heard about this opportunity when he returned to London after his trip to Antwerp, and he immediately turned and headed to Paris to try to get an audience with the king because he wanted to lobby for this commission. But though he made it there, he did not get the job. That commission went to French painters Nicolas Poussin and Simon Vouet. At this point, the 42-year-old Van Dyck was not well. His health had been in decline, and this frantic pace of his life, including going back to Antwerp and France once again before returning to England, had taken a toll. He had developed a tremor in his right hand that was bad enough that he couldn't sign his name. Naturally, he was concerned about this, and he said to have visited a number of physicians in the hope of finding a cure, but nothing came of it. King Charles I was deeply concerned for his painter and friend, so much so that he offered 300 pounds as a reward for anyone who could help. The king's own physician attended to Van Dyke, but he was unable to cure him or improve his condition. Van Dyke's daughter with Mary, named Justiniana, was born on December 1st, 1641. Anthony was at the birth. The baby was baptized a little over a week later on December 9th, and just hours after that, Van Dyke died at his home in Blackfriars. In between Justiniana's birth and her baptism, knowing clearly how serious his health crisis was, Van Dyke had made his will. And that will actually contained a surprise. Justiniana was not his first child he had been hiding another daughter, born to one of his mistresses all the way back in 1622 when he was in his early career in Antwerp. And his sister Susanna had raised that girl, named Maria Theresa, who was just shy of 20 when he died, and he provided for her in his will. Van Dyck was buried in England in Old St. Paul's Cathedral. The king ordered a monument to be erected over the final resting place, although what was inscribed on it is reported differently by various sources. We cannot verify which is correct because this monument burned in the Great Fire in 1666. Van Dyck's collection of print portraits, Iconography, published four years after his death in 1645. And that has become sort of a visual directory of many of Antwerp's most prominent citizens during Van Dyck's career. For example, there are two portraits of Peter Bruegel the Younger in that group that are particularly striking. Van Dyck's legacy really cannot be overstated. His work truly changed portraiture in England, And a lot of artists who came after him, including Thomas Gainsborough, painter of the famous Blue Boy portrait, and Sir Joshua Reynolds, who helped found the Royal Academy of Arts, all cite him as a primary influence. As has no doubt been evident throughout this episode, there are huge gaps in the record of Van Dyke's life. And some of this may have been purposeful, because it's possible that a man with the kinds of secrets he would only divulge, for example, in his will might not have wanted to account for his various visits to places he traveled as anything more than, I just have business there. But some of it is also just that records were lacking, a lot of records burned, uh, and people just didn't track every little thing. And the interesting result of all of this in Van Dyke's case is that we don't know how many paintings he made. There are estimates, but those vary from 200 to 500 pieces. And because he was so influential, a lot of artists that followed took great pains to try to capture his style in their work. 
He also had a lot of assistants, so this all has led to some uncertain attributions over the years. Some have eventually been attributed to the assistance of his workshop, but there are a lot of others that still have question marks. As recently as 2019, there was a new identification made when just such a work, Portrait of the Infanta Isabella Clara Eugenia, was identified as an original Van Dyke. <sighs> <laughs> Really You're so happy talking about art. I am. I love it. And I really love his, I um, I will talk about it some in the behind the scenes, like the way I plagued some of my friends by sending them photographs of Van Dyke work and going, could you believe this was painted 400 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I just, uh, mind boggling. Um, I do have some listener mail which comes from our listener, Caitlin, and it is about planners, and specifically planners and ADHD. Caitlin writes, Hi, Holly and Tracy, and Happy New Year. Listening to the New Year's Day episode on planners and almanacs, as well as the behind-the-scenes, brought back a visceral memory of being in elementary school and having the teacher distribute planners to each student. They were August to June to align with the school year, and every month there were little quotes and fun facts, as well as so many holidays. Every day when we were given homework, our teacher would ask us to pull out our planners and write down the details. Concerts, field trips, any other reason a nine-year-old might need to know a date? Into the planner. I inevitably would lose my planner several times a semester or fish it out, crumpled and unmarked from the bottom of my backpack when challenged. Because I usually did my homework in class after my other work, missing technical deadlines was no big deal. Fast forward to age 23, and it turned out I have ADHD. All of my efforts and attempts at systems and bullet journals and calendars had been thwarted, not by innate laziness or it not being for me, but by brain worms. <laughs> A few years out, I'm on ADHD meds, and my color-coded dry erase calendar lives with my fridge and is strictly up-to-date, mostly. Hope y'all are well, and I've attached some Sharktopus photos as pet tax. She was recently put on a diet after being certified chonky at the vet, and she hates it a lot. Um, yeah, I've had a cat on a diet, and he didn't like it one bit. Um, she also asks about accessibility when we plan our trips. The answer is Yes but also it becomes difficult to gauge accessibility when we're planning international trips sometimes. Um, but we do always consider it. It doesn't always work out, obviously. It's kind of tricky on international travel, uh, but I hope nobody thinks that we're just ignoring that. Uh, this cat is very cute. She looks like a dilute calico. It's hard to tell because she's in shadow. She may be full calico, um, but the cutest thing on the planet. Listen, I love a chunky cat. Mm -hmm. I also really like this email because while well, we talked about planners and how people... Some people love planners. We didn't really talk about how planners can be very flummoxing for people sometimes when they don't even really realize why. Um, and I think it's valid to discuss that, like, there are some people that just look at a planner and it looks like torture. So um, while I love them because I, you know, have a little bit of attention issues myself, for me, that's like the good tool. But I understand that doesn't work for everybody. Um Anyway, I hope, whether you're a planner person or not, that you're having a great start to the new year. I suppose you could write us if you would wish and share your experiences and maybe your kitties or puppies or snakes or tarantulas or whatever pets you have and enjoy. I would love it if someone would send us some uh, some Corvid pictures. Anybody got a pet raven? Send that along. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> You can do that at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're also on social media as Missed in History, and you can subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app and anywhere else you get your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.